So color vision standards are not important in predicting pilot performance. These standards can safely be eliminated. I guess we can see the results. Wow, they want you. Well, that's good to see that because that uh, directly tells me how I need to, uh, to approach this, this lecture. Um, we had a very nice talk yesterday morning on the color vision challenges uh, with displays and specifically with um, transparent displays. My job at the Air Medical Consultation Service deals with aerospace vision standards. So I'm going to touch on that, some of the challenges that we have with the display technology that we've got. Next slide, please. We talked about this yesterday, how uh, color is coming into the cockpits more and more all the time. And not just in the cockpit, next slide, please, but in the helmet display systems that we have and also in the uh, ground station consoles. There's no requirements that I'm aware of that are being delivered to display manufacturers to develop displays for uh, color deficient individuals. And neither are there requirements that I'm aware of where uh, the displays need to be compatible with vision enhancement and vision protective devices. Next slide, please. This is, is, is an example of a, a ground station for a remotely piloted uh, aircraft control station. Uh, Proton is, uh, this is a severe protonomalous simulation. Protonomalous is a red cone deficiency. Deuteronomous is green cone deficiency. Tritin is blue cone deficiency. Within the, uh, the retina, there's three separate cone types, red, uh, green, and blue. So we can simulate what an individual with a color vision deficiency, in this situation a severe color vi vision deficiency, would see and compare that to normal. So you see for the protan and dutan that the red-green ground track that overlays the terrain map, they look pretty much the same. And in some situations, the track that the aircraft are flying blends in with the terrain map. So like what we heard yesterday, some of the information, if you don't have the appropriate background or don't have control of the background, then you have a problem. So the, from the air crew standards perspective, the problem that we've got now is in our trained air crew population, there are individuals who've got color vision deficiency. So what our challenge is, is to determine whether or not that's safe and whether or not they're effective in their mission and how to deal with that population. On the front end, we can control for it by selecting out color abnormal individuals, but there, there's a trade-off for that because if we're selecting all color deficient individuals out, how do we know that individuals with mild color vision deficiency or moderate color vision deficiency are not, or the, we perhaps are screening out people who have uh, adequate capabilities. So there's a lot that we need to learn for the specific task and where we need to draw the selection standards. Next slide, please. It's not just within the cockpit, it's outside the cockpit as well. Somebody who has a red-green colored vision deficiency and they're monitoring a camera mounted to um, an RPA, a remotely piloted aircraft, and they're tasked to track the red car with the green roof, well, these two look the same. Color vision deficient individuals often will rely on brightness cues, but if the brightness level is essentially identical between these two vehicles, then the color vision deficient individual, someone who's got a red-green color abnormality, may confuse that and track the wrong vehicle. So it's an important operational question. Next slide, please. Let's look at a vision enhancement device. The U.S. Air Force has in the inventory a visor called the high contrast visor, which if you look at it objectively is a little bit of a misnomer because there's really no strong scientific evidence that the high contrast visor is going to produce higher level of contrast sensitivity. Where this is most beneficial is in air-to-air uh, -air type operations where you have a blue background, a blue sky, 
you're filtering out the blue light with this filter, so that might make it easier to acquire a target against that blue background. However, if you go inside the aircraft and look at the displays, white symbology can become yellow with this visor. Blue symbology can become green. Next, please. Next. So what happens with this high contrast, without the high contrast visor, this symbology indicates that the missile shot is on target. However, with the high contrast visor, the symbology changes and the pilot has to decide uh, whether or not the missile is lost and whether to expend an additional missile. So it can become operationally important. Because of this problem, the U.S. Air Force restricted the high contrast visor use uh, back in the um, early 90s to specific aircraft and only use uh, could be used under certain operational conditions. Uh, the A-10, for instance, was an uh, aircraft where the high contrast visor was approved for, not for ground uh, flight close to the ground, but uh, in air-to-air uh, -air type operations. So the problem that we've got with aircraft platforms where we approve the high, con high contrast visor, the display symbology, the, the displays change over time, so now the, this generation of A-10s have got different symbolic, have got different displays, so we're faced with this, uh, this process again of having to look at what the effect is of using this enhancement device uh, within the cockpit of specific aircraft. Next slide, please can look at the flight safety issue. One of the arguments that uh, I've heard uh, in debates over whether or not we need color vision standards is, well, we're not aware of any, any fatalities relating, related to someone for, uh, that had color vision efficiency. Well, fortunately, in this mishap, there were no fatalities either. And fortunately, the crew lived to tell the story where we could try to figure out better what happened with this. This uh, FedEx aircraft crashed uh, uh, half mile short of the runway, doing an approach at night. The ILS system was out, uh, instrument landing system, so the mishap pilot was reliant upon the PAPI lighting system to, uh, to fly the approach. Uh, the flight data recorder and the radar tape revealed that one mile out, the pilot was uh, at a low altitude. And he testified to the NTSB that he flew the PAPIs into the ground. Well, in fact, when we looked back, interviewed the pilot, reviewed all the data, uh, the pilot was uh, below where he ought to have been. He perceived that he had four white lights with the PAPI system, which to him indicated that he was too high. He increased his descent rate and crashed a half a mile short of the runway. In reality, he had four red lights, but perceived that as being too high rather than too low. Next slide, please. The U.S. Air Force uh, uh, have, have addressed the color vision we've issued and we've been looking at the standards uh, for a long time. We had uh, the, uh, the Devorn, which we call the PIP-1, so Devorn plates, uh, 12 of 14 evolved to be our standard because 10 of 14 wasn't uh, sensitive enough in picking up individuals with color vision deficiency. We also added additional tests to look at um, picking up acquired color vision efficiency, which commonly will present as a blue-yellow type of efficiency, and also to add sensitivity to our um, detection capability, we added this F2 plate, which is illustrated right here. Uh, combined, these uh, three tests gave us uh, sensitivity of detection in our pilot training applicant population of 85%, 15% of individuals who had color vision deficiency, despite doing three pseudoisochromic plate books, uh, were able to pass. Uh, were able to pass this battery of tests. Uh, a study that we did, we did the PIP, all three of these uh, PIP type tests, the pseudoisochromic plate booklets, in addition to anomaloscope testing, uh, in order to determine what what our um, our false negative rate was, and we found that. 15% uh, were not detected by this uh, type of methodology. Next slide, please. 
when we look at uh, pilot training applicants, when we raised our standard up to uh, 12 or 14, uh, in our trained uh, pilot population, uh, with the DeVorn PIP-1 booklet, we have a 96% detection success. When you use, uh, in this particular study, which is different than the complete battery of study that, that I just spoke about, uh, when you look at pilot training applicants, uh, we fail to detect 22%. So what's the difference? These individuals, when we detect a color vision deficiency, they don't go to pilot training. These individuals who we detect a deficiency, we give them a waiver after we get an operational check uh, from, the, from the line stating that they're capable of doing their current job. Um, if, if we get that statement, then those trained air crew are returned to flight status. These don't have a motivation to study for the test. These individuals do have a motivation to study for the test, and they do study for the test, and they're very successful in getting a good score. Next slide, please. There's a variety of different color vision testing methodologies we can use. The pseudoisochromic plate books, there's a lamp lantern test, this is the Farnsworth 100, uh, a desaturated uh, D15 test, and the anomaloscope. For the U.S. Air Force, there's problems with each of these in using, that, using the testing in um, a, a large uh, population. We don't have a centralized um, medical examination process. The base is tasked to do, uh, each Air Force base is tasked to do um, the flight physicals rather than centrally. If you do a central process, anomaloscope testing kind of makes sense. But there, there may be better ways uh, in the future that, uh, that we can do color vision testing other than anomaloscope testing. Next slide, please. So with the anomaloscope, which has long been considered the gold standard color vision test, uh, it's expensive. In the, in the U.S., it's about $8,000 per unit. Uh, it requires a long testing time, requires specialized technical expertise. In the U.S., it's primarily used in research centers. Um, and it's really not practical for the reasons stated for widespread Air Force screening use. Next slide. So what's the solution? Well, we wrestled with this for a long period of time and a few years ago we started developing this test called the Cone Contrast Test. Uh, and today it's the new Air Force Color Vision Standard. It's based on cone-specific contrast sensitivity. It's computer-based uh, and presents a random target sequence. So the person can't study in advance for the sequencing of the test. And it's really difficult to use additional cues and some of the methods that's used for pseudoisochromic plate booklets to, uh, to defeat this test. Although we're dealing with a very clever, highly motivated population, so if there's a way around it, they're going to find ways to, to, uh, to beat this test as well. So we, uh, from the air crew standards perspective, we try to stay one, head, one step ahead of what, uh, what our pilot training applicants are, are trying to do. Uh, this is the uh, cone contrast test, how it's uh, set up on the platform. It's a little netbook device, each letter, uh, red letter, green letter, blue letter is presented in decreasing levels of contrast. Um, there's a calibration pro program that comes with the test and the score is printed out. It's stored. Hopefully in the future we'll have networking capability where we can plug this into our electronic medical record system. Next slide please. So it determines, just like a hearing test, it determines what the threshold for color recognition is for each cone type. It can quantify normal and abnormal color vision. It can indicate the severity of um, hereditary deficiency and also reveal color vision loss as an early sign of ocular systemic or neurologic disease where color vision is affected in those processes. And Importantly, for the operational correlation studies, we get a quantitative linear score out of it that, can, uh, that we can use to determine who, what task can be uh, adequately performed uh, when we design experiments to correlate color vision testing capability to operational performance. We don't have that capability with the pseudoisochromic plate booklets or the other uh, color vision testing methods that I mentioned. 
Next slide, please. This is a scoring method. Uh, from the psychological standpoint, we, I particularly like this one. Our air crew like to feel good about themselves, so we want to reward them for good performance. So we have a super normal vision to uh, uh, category if they get 95 to 100. So we can um, quantify normal performance as well as abnormal performance and then correlate that in the future to operational task performance. Next slide, please. I mentioned this statistic earlier uh, using the PIP1, 2, and F2 plate, 85% sensitivity in comparison to anomaloscope scope testing with um, the cone contrast test in the study that we did comparison to the Nagel and anomaloscope, scope uh, with data obtained from the original cone contrast test software that was developed at the School of Aerospace Medicine under optimal testing conditions, we got a 100% correlation between uh, the cone contrast test and the scope. Uh, now the cone contrast test is on a commercial device. It's being used in um, different locations. The testing methodology uh, might vary from optimal, so I don't expect this to be a universally applicable standard. But it's, if it's done correctly, and the calibration, everything is done correctly, we can achieve the same level of sensitivity as we achieve with the uh, anomaloscope. scope. Next, please. I, if you were here on Monday, I talked about this test. Uh, it's a uh, target sorting task, that uh, a, an experiment that we're doing with operationally based vision assessment pro program. Uh, with this task, the uh, uh, subject is asked to determine when the enemy aircraft, the red enemy aircraft, is in the kill zone. So this simulates what a, deuter, uh, a deuteranope would see. The red and green targets uh, look the same. So you'd expect uh, somebody with a severe color vision deficiency to uh, make more errors and take longer to respond to, to the uh, presentations. Next slide, please. So with the operationally based vision assessment program, we're going to correlate speed and accuracy to performance and compare how normal and abnormal individuals do. Now, some people naturally will trade uh, time for accuracy. It'll take them longer to respond in order to get a higher score. So there's a way statistically to normalize that data. Next slide, please. We can look at drift rate, which essentially multiplies time and uh, accuracy to give you a single in index, and then we can compare that to uh, the, um, uh, between the normals and the abnormal population. And we're going to use this diffusion model, uh, I think, for the majority of the operationally based vision assessment program testing that we do. Uh, everything, we're, we're specifically interested in time and accuracy on our operational performance measures. Uh, next slide, please. And next, this is just a chart representation of what the cone contrast test looks like with red, green, blue cones. In the automated version, uh, uh, individual randomized sequence of letters is presented, and then the score comes. And next slide, please. And then we can correlate. Uh, deficiency in this situation, green, co green cone score to drift rate, drift rate performance. Next, please. So in summary, um, cone contrast test is one of many methods. That's the one that, that we developed at USAF SAM, but there's other automated um, tests that are becoming uh, on the market all the time. I think vision testing over time is going to evolve away from um, ma manual testing where you have to have a technician to write the results down. I think we're going to see more and more uh, computer-based vision testing um, methods evolve over time. This is a very good thing to do because it gives you a lot of the advantages that, that I talked about. So in, if your countries are interested in doing operational, core, uh, operational correlation studies as well, you need to have a quantitative scoring method. Choose a test, whether it's a cone contrast test or any other the new methods uh, to do a similar thing uh, to be able to correlate that with, uh, with operational performance. 
the effects of vision enhancement and uh, visual protective uh, te technologies can be assessed with a device like this, with a method like the cone contrast test. And air crew vision standards can either be validated or adjusted based on the objective evidence that, uh, that we obtain from doing these types of studies. That concludes my presentation. I'll take any questions and go to the last slide if you'd like. Okay, there's probably not going to be a surprise there, but let's see if uh, you're voting the same thing as you did before. 